Are we on? Yeah. Hello everyone, welcome to the Rugby League Lunch Hour here on LoveRugbyLeague.com. I'm James Gordon, joined by Drew Derbyshire. Um, we're sponsored by Betfred, thanks as always to Betfred for their continuing support. Um, please do join in with the comments, let us know what you want to talk about. We've got to just stretch this out for an hour with no games and other stuff. Well, yeah, there's some games, we'll talk about them in a minute, but um, if you want us to talk about anything in particular, please do leave your comments. If you want to shout out, whatever, Drew will be uh, yeah. keeping an eye on them. So we'll do we'll do shout outs and comments every maybe 15 minutes um, throughout the show. We're here every Thursday, 12 to 1. Um, we'll start with um, the big news of the week, I suppose, is uh, Sam Burgess, um, his retirement, Drew. Um, give me your thoughts on that. Sad, isn't it? Um... When all, when when I seen all the reports coming from down under at the start of the week saying that there's a possibility he could retire, I didn't really believe it. I thought it might have been the, the Aussie media making it more of an issue than what it actually was. Um, but it turns out they, they were quite right, and he's hung up his boots. It's uh, been an incredible career for him. Uh, he's only 30 as well, so it, it is an early retirement, um, far earlier than what we probably would have expected. He might, he might have been able to play the, the 2025 World Cup with the way um, Burgess played the game. Um, he could have been playing when he, when he was 35, but, but the 2025 World Cup, of course, is, is the 2021 World Cup as well. Um, I, I think it's, it's just it's quite sad, isn't it, for, for especially the, the British game, but obviously rugby league in general. Uh, he's been a, a phenomenal athlete. He's, he's took the NRL by storm. I think he's his brother Tom described him as a trailblazer for him and his family. But I think he's a trailblazer blazer for for any British player because we've seen a lot more uh, British players go over to the NRL and at least test themselves uh, down under in, uh, in recent years, especially since they've the, the trio. Well, the, the four Burgesses, in fact, uh, went over to. Um, Australia uh, you, all those years ago. I, I've just pulled it up here. So there's a guy on Twitter, an RL physio. It's Brian Cini, I think he's called. He's a physio and an injury analysis. And he's basically broken down all Burgess' injuries because it's not the injury that's stopped him playing. It's an infection that he's got during surgery or something of that ilk. So he, he ran through a bit of a thread on, on what, what Burgess has gone through. So in 2010, he had a, a left shoulder subluxation playing for England and had reconstruction sur surgery, that was three months recovery. In 2011, he injured the same left shoulder on his first game back. Um, he didn't have surgery then, but was out for four weeks. He had ankle, he got an ankle injury late in the season and ended up having a shoulder reconstruction while obviously he couldn't play because of his ankle. And then fast forward to this year, um, he had a new shoulder injury during a tackle in round five. Um, he played on with that until round 13 and then had a clean out um, surgical procedure to remove loose bodies and scar tissue. Um, and then it was after that that he had the infection was reported that he'd, he'd got an infection during the surgery. He needed antibiotics. Um, he missed a few couple of weeks. And then in the very last game of the season, um, there's a video actually, so if you're on the NRL physio on Twitter, there's a video of him making a tackle. Um, is it our mate that? Jared Croker. Oh, it's tackling. Ja it's, he's tackling Jared Croker, and he and he and he and he rolls. He, he pulls up with a with a shoulder injury. Um, he's he's definitely holding his shoulder there, and, and I mean that transpires. That was his last um, his last game. Um, infections, they're saying, only happen in one or two percent of post surgical patients. Um, and basically what's happened is the infection's basically just eaten into his insides. Into, yeah, into so into his like his shoulder his joint, is shoulders, it or something? Yeah. And um now there's a few it's I think he says in the it's the joint between it's for mobility and stability, and we read something where he can't lift his arm above was it fifty degrees, ninety, 90 degrees, he can't lift his arm above ninety degrees, um, which obviously must be quite painful. Um there's a bit of an issue because obviously he's retiring, it's a medical retirement that obviously Souths will be wanting to get him off the cap and, and all that. Um, and there's a bit of debate about whether it's a new injury or a pre-existing one. So whether they will be able to get the cap space or not is, a, is another um, another debate. Um, so it'd be interesting to see there. They've been linked with Tyson Frizzell, haven't they? 
the former Wales international who plays for Australia now. Um, Welsh mother, tongue and father, born in Australia. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I would say a shame. There's shame. an interesting report, uh, what we'll speak about in a bit as well, um, relating to Sonny Bill Williams as well. Oh, well, uh, which I'm sure you'll like, Jim. There was, um, there was, uh, there was a, a bit of a murmur I seen on Twitter last night. Is, is it going to, do you think South will have a look at Luke Thompson? Yeah. From St. Helens? I think they'd be pretty stupid not to have a look at Luke Thompson if I'm honest. But do you think they but, but getting him for next he's getting him for next season surely a no go, is it? Well why would it be though? He's only got he's one, one year on the He's only got one year left. So it's not as though he's on a four year deal and it'll it'll take something crazy to, to oh, so you, so you that think deal. so you think Saints will say, right, give us hundred grand transfer fee or something? Well Saints Saints are different out to like say like a Wigan uh, in respects in, in many respects in terms of letting the players go over to the NRL or selling the players early, uh, in effect. Uh, Saints seem to prefer them running down the contracts and just leaving uh, on the yeah, face of seems it's... Whereas Wigan like to maybe cash in with two or three years left on, on a contract and, and get some money for the players uh, because I... they know they can back it up with the youngsters. But Saints can back it up with the youngsters. I think what well. we've seen with Saints is obviously with Makington and Wormsley, they Saints have basically offered them longer deals to fight off the NRL. Yeah. Whereas, like you say, with Wigan, it's almost been a bit like, well, you can go to the NRL, but we'll have first refusal on you coming back. Would that be the best thing for St. Helens to do with Thompson? You know, ultimately look and think, I suppose they've got a few options. Is Do I'm... you offer him a, a marquee deal, four years to stay? Do you say to him, Right, we'll let you go now, but we want a transfer fee and we want first refusal on when you come back. Or do they just sit on this one year, have him for next year, and then he's free to go at the end of that first year, uh, his last year? Because there's the three it's, options, it's aren't It's so they? tough, isn't it? Be because Saints are in effect, I know they're the champions and right, so, but in effect they're enter entering, um, not, not a transition season, but they're entering a, a, a new era of Saints because Christian Wolf's coming in, there's no Justin Holbrook anymore. Uh, it's a different philosophy, a different style of play. Uh, Wolf will, will want to make changes because he'll want to put his own spin on things uh, with Saints. So it's it's, it's hard. To, it's, I reckon Saints would want Thompson to stay for next year. I suppose the other, difficult, the other difficult thing, I suppose, he won't be on a lot of cash, you wouldn't imagine. No, no so especially compared to Sam Burgess, so, who, so, who, who, yeah. who in effect so it, it's, it's not as if if Thompson went, you would never be able to replace him on the money you've saved from him coming, yeah. from him going, would you? Because obviously, you know, the man of the match in the grand final, you know, you'd never. So obviously, there's a salary cap. I mean, we know Saints have got the marquee space that they could potentially use. Um, you know, what, what, so what do you think will happen? Do you think he'll be at Saints next year? Yeah, I, I, I think he'll be at Saints, but then again, I'd, I'd also think Saints would be pretty stupid. Uh, pretty silly not to to try and lure Thompson over to the NRL because I think he's I think Thompson's at the right stage of his career to make the move as well. If I'm honest, he's I think he's 24, maybe 25. Uh, he's he's already the the best prop in in Super League now. Uh, he's been the best prop in Super League for the last two seasons. He's he's obviously won the Super League. He'd probably like to have the have the Challenge Cup. Um, to his uh, to his collection, but a Harry Sunderland Trophy winner, he's probably it's safe to say that established international as well. Four England caps, um, uh, a Great Britain cap all the way ended ended early mm -hmm. in the game against Tonga. I think I think he's at, at, at the right time, and I think with Thompson, I think you get you, he's he's guaranteed to crack it over there. I think we we knew that Bateman would crack it over there. It's not as lo as though it's it's a signing like um, Carl Watkins where it's like well, will he make it or will he not make it down under? I think I think everyone's pretty confident in, in Thompson's ability and I think he'd it'd, it'd, it'd fit in easily do, over there. Do you think Souths maybe feel like they've missed a bit of an opportunity because obviously they they obviously got Burgess over and then they have the four Burgesses at one point but they've not really they've not looked elsewhere have they for English players mm -hmm. and then. All of a sudden, Canberra have brought in Bateman, Whitehead, Hodgson, and found a great deal of success. Well, the, the thing, the thing with Canberra is none of the overseas players, so none of the summer ones are top. Well, not I'm not saying none, but a large proportion of the Tongan summer ones, Australians, um, New Zealanders, wanted to uh, go go to Canberra because it's it's freezing. It's freezing. It's it's like British weather in Canberra. 
um, a lot of the time. Um, so the Raiders have picked up on on that opportunity of bringing and luring British players uh, to the Raiders, and uh, it's paid off. And I think a lot of people have kind of sw- switched, haven't they? From from a lot of English people have, have switched from supporting the the Rabbit Holes and they've moved over to to the Raiders now, haven't they? Because obviously there's, there's five um, British players over there, so I think I think Canberra are very smart in what they're doing. But why not? I th- like I was having a conversation, I think it was with Oliver Gildart a couple of weeks ago, and I was saying, it's, it, there's, there's not just a, a handful of Super League players now that could play in the NRL like, like we were seeing maybe 10 or 15 years ago. You, you could probably name 20, 20 yeah. um, English players in Super League who could go, or 20 British players in Super League who, who could easily uh, do a job in the NRL. <laughs> It's it's frustrating sometimes because when 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 the NRL comes up in conversation, everyone automatically thinks of Cameron Smith. Everyone automatically thinks of Cooper Cronk. Uh, everyone thinks of uh, silly Arty Vunavalu on the wings. But not every single player in the NRL is of that ilk. Yeah, there, yeah. there are players who are average in the NRL. Who, who, you... who some Super League players are, are far better than. For example, Liam Watts. Liam Watts could easily could, could go and do a, a job in the NRL. But obviously, the, but, but, when you compare him to an NRL, you always you automatically think of the best players. So you're all, you're already automatically comparing Liam Watts to uh, Josh Papali, who's, who's arguably the best front rower. Well, I, I mean, I, I like Liam Watts, but is it? I suppose a couple of points is why is he not in the Great Britain squad then? But then also, do you think that players like Liam Watts look better in Super League because the quality of Super League is? sort of declining because more players are going to the NRL. So obviously the the best British players ultimately yeah, are playing in the NRL. Too. There's what, you know, eight or nine the best British players playing in the NRL. The imports that we get from I know last season the tide sort of changed a bit and we had Merrion and Blake Austin and Coote and stuff. But the imports from the NRL aren't of the same calibre as they were maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, like you know, Jamie Light and Trent Barrett. Players like that who, who came over and were like world class. Is it a case of the players over here are standing out a bit more because the quality of the competition's a bit lower? I don't. I don't think so. I think. I think we're still. We're still seeing um, top class players come over from the NRL. I know they're not. They're not like Jimmy Lyons and, and Trent Barrett, as you say. But I think we're, we're still seeing the likes of Blake Austin, Jackson Hastings, Josiah Fecky's coming over next year, George Burgess. Um, so. I, no, I, dis- I disagree with your point there. I think I think Super League is improving, and in rugby league we're, qu- we're quick to jump on negativity. We all are. I I, I jump on negativity at times. I think I think that's just um, a northern attitude, if I'm honest. Uh, it's but 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 I think Super League as a whole, quality wise, it might not be be improving in or off the field areas, but. I certainly think that the product on the field is probably as entertaining as it has uh, been. I mean, I think. I mean. Uh, it's more the league's a lot more competitive. Like the, I think I think this is part of the issue is obviously if you look at maybe again 10, 15, 20 years ago, I think the teams at the top were better than the teams at the mm. top now. But the the thing was back then you had the teams at the bottom were getting trolleyed 60, 70 mil or whatever. Whereas now and, ev- and at that time everyone used to moan we want a competitive league and then now we've got a competitive league. Everyone moans about the quality going down. So it's almost like. You've got that competitive league, you now just want to try and improve everyone's mm-hmm. quality. And I think we were saying this last week, great achievement by Salford to reach a grand final, but I think they're a good example of how the league has, in terms of the competitiveness, has not not the quality, well, the quality has declined, but everyone's boxed together, aren't they? And it's almost been like, instead of everyone joining the top teams up there, there's been a little bit of the top teams have been dragged down a little bit and the... The, the smaller teams of whereas what you want now is now they're tight you want them to be moving up like that don't you in, almost in quality terms um, well, if it, you say that but if you look at the amount of money that Leeds have spent over the last couple of seasons in trying to get it right on the field and, and look where they are compared to, to where Salford are yeah I, I mean I mean listen this, it's not an exact science because if it was then obviously it'd be pointless playing wouldn't it you know if we could just say right well the, the richest teams with the best players are going to win the league every year then it'd be pointless playing speaking of riches then let's talk about Sonny Bill Williams so um, Toronto have made a 9 million 
Australian dollars, which is about four and a half million pounds, um, pre Brexit, um, over two years. So that's like that's basically a full salary cap. He's earning per year if he signs for Toronto, which is outrageous, really. This, this will be the biggest transfer in rugby history, surely. Well, no, yes, yeah, it this would happens. be. But but is it worth? Is it worth it? I know that sounds like a daft question. Because two point whatever two point three million on a player uh, per year, and we talk about growing the game, we talk about expansion, we talk about this. Imagine what two point three million a year could do if you invested that in grassroots or whatever in Toronto. Now, obviously, David Argyle can spend his money how he wants, and I'm not telling him how to spend his money. But is so, I know they said they want this David Beckham figure, but it's completely different because David Beckham was known throughout the world as a footballer. Yes, yeah, Sonny Bill's big in rugby, but he's not a... If the average Joe bumped into him in the street, they may not necessarily know who he is in England, let alone in Canada. Um, and we were having a chat about this yesterday. If you were a back rower at Toronto and, and you were earning 100 grand a year and Sonny Bill's on the other side and he's missed a tackle and he's earning 2.3 million and you're thinking, well, bloody hell, why should I bend my back to, to, to chase back? Yeah, yeah it's, it's got that, as, as you say, but on the flip side, it could galvanise Toronto mm. and they, they could... They, they could go on a surge and finish in the top five next season in Super League. Uh, so it could go one or two ways, but Sonny Bill will even in Super League. No, without Toronto Wolfpack, Sonny Bill would have never would have never played um, in yeah. Super League. Uh, so we've got got to credit the Wolfpack in that respect. But we've we've also we've already seen them spend what is it four hundred grand a year on yeah. on Ricky Latelli. Do you, do you think? Do you think from who came from Granola Samoa International. Do you think it could be the start of getting rid of the salary cap if they bring him over? I think so, Super League will uh, certainly consider it. I, I, because, I, I think they consider I mean, I, I don't, scrapping it. I mean, Wigan, Wigan don't strike me like they've got pots of money to be throwing at, at it, but I'm sure there's other teams, like Warrington, I suppose, where... they've got players who are already on marquee. It's so like Warrington have got Austin, haven't they? Yeah. Have they got, who else has gone? Widdip. So they've got Austin and Widdip on marquee. Now, however much they're paying them, I don't know, Austin's probably on maybe three, four hundred grand a year. They're stuck now. They can't sign anyone else. Even if they had 10 million, they couldn't sign them because them two players are already on the marquee money. Now, if you scrap the salary cap, who's to say Warrington couldn't have gone in for Sonny Bill or whatever? I'm not saying, obviously, they couldn't now if they didn't have Austin and Widdle, but obviously, the restriction of, of the market at the moment. I, I don't know, is that... Any, it, do you think... Because to me, I understand the whole... It, this is a good example of the marquee thing where only 175 grand counts, but then all of a sudden you're thinking, well, it's sort of a bit silly, really, when you can have one player earning 2.3 million. You can basically have two players earning 2 million, but no one else can earn over 150 grand. It's a bit... It, it just creates a little bit of... Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think I've said previously that I, I'd scrap the cap. Um, I, I, just, I, I, just, I just think it, it just seems a bit balmy, to be fair. It's like it, in, in football, not letting Manchester City spend money and, and, and making sure Burnley spend near enough the same amount of money as Manchester City. Yeah, because that's, that's, that's almost what... contributed to... You know we were talking before about shutting yeah. ch- down. That's almost contributed yeah. to that, hasn't it? Because in terms of... In, in real money, the salary cap... I think I think someone worked this out. I've seen it on Twitter that effectively the salary cap should probably be a million pound more than it is mm. because of the way you know the cost of living and all that palaver. And I think if if you look at say like say you saw for the game and Wakefield and whatever, they've been able to catch up because they, it's more affordable for them to spend the cap now. Whereas it, it you know for the top teams they've almost been like banging their heads Drag against back. the wall. Yeah, yeah. It'd be really interesting to know, you know, if if the likes of Saints. Leeds, maybe Hull, Catalan, whether them clubs are genuinely are genuinely like wanting to spend more money and they're held back, or whether it, it might not. From our point of view, it might we don't know. It might not be an issue. They might not be sat there thinking, "Oh, bloody heck, I wish we had, I wish we could spend more money." Catalans as well. They, yeah, they, that, they spend a you know, like, like look at Casford as an example. I think Casford. Someone might be able to correct me on this. I'm sure Casford reported that their turnover is is up to like eight eight million or something, seven or eight million, which is unbelievable for when you look at Casford as a club. And obviously, if you remove the salary cap, that might harm them more than others because obviously then all of a sudden 
are they going to have to stretch those? And that's the concern, isn't it? If you remove the salary cap, that teams like Casford and are going to have to, you know, maybe spend beyond the means to compete. And, and it, but then we talk about obviously you want all these glamorous teams and stuff. You want, you want the best players, don't you? Yeah, and it's like you want, do you, you want you want the likes of Cooper Cronk to spend the season here. Even because it, it, here. it would actually make the NRL if you did it. The NRL might think, oh, actually, exactly. You know, yeah. uh, you know, and and because what you want is you want someone like you know, like Kukash Salford. I, I, you know, I've, I've, I've spoke to Kukash and met him a few times, and you know, his heart's in the right place, but the way that he managed it at Salford was dreadful. You know, he just chucked money at. at not average players, but not superstar players. Where did, where did yeah. Kevin Lock get up to? Oh, I don't know. Did he not go to Rugby Union? Yeah. He went to Wakefield, didn't he, after he was at Solvay? Yeah, yeah. And then he had a bit of, he was in a bit of trouble, wasn't he? But uh, uh, what I was going to say was, Kukash obviously chucked a load of money in, but was just signing players almost like willy-nilly, didn't build a team. And it's like you almost want to create an environment that investment like that is welcomed. But he's managed in the right way. So imagine if you know, if you looked at Wigan now, say if someone come along and said, Right, Wigan, I'm gonna invest five million. You know, they don't want to have the set he's still run by Chris Radlinski and whatever, but you've got the money behind him. And I do think that there are people out there that would back a club to help them make big signings. Because I think I can't remember what club it was I was speaking to, and they were telling me that someone had rang them up, a sponsor had rang them up and said they'd have X amount of money. And they were like, we're talking about signing such a body. And they were like, how much do you need? Because they wanted that club. I can't remember what club it was now, but they wanted the, the club mm. was like, they wanted a new signing. And, and, and this sponsor, he was like, I don't know, it was like a scrap metal firm or something. I can't remember what it was. But that's the thing that turns sponsors on in some ways. It's like, if you can be the guy that brought, like say Cooper Cronk or, or whoever over, and you contribute to that. I think that's what gets people, you know, and there's a lot of talk at the moment about, I, I've been in a few conversations on Twitter about the new kits coming out with like three million sponsors on, and it's just like... Louis, Louis says, afternoon chaps, afternoon Louis. Uh, he also says, keep the salary cap and expand the marquee play rule to three or four. Would this help bring in more superstars? Um, so if you doubled it to what it is now, to four, could, could that work? I or suppose you, or, 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 I suppose I, you I, could. I, 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 as well, just scrap the car. I mean, it's difficult because you're a bit like, you know, imagine how much, you know, all the auditing process and all that. If you scrap the salary cap, all that goes, and all of a sudden you're saving yourself a bit of a bit of headache there. If you've got four, then I suppose yeah, you could say, well, Warrington could look at it now, and but they'd still need to find that extra hundred and seventy-five grand or whatever it is on the cap, wouldn't they? Is it George Burns to marquee at Wigan next year? Yeah, Birch and Hastings, would it not be? I can't remember. But, 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 but anyway, like they've still got to find the 175 grand on the cap, haven't they? So even if, if, you, if you turned around now and said to Warrington, right, you'll have two extra marquee players, they'd still have to, have, they'd still have to find another 350 grand on the cap mm. to recruit them. And I just don't think that even with the extra marquee money that, they would, that you'd necessarily have the room to do that. Mm. I don't know. It, it is a tough one because when you when you think of, of clubs near the bottom, so say Oldersfield for example, and Hull KR, they'd, they'd did slip, wouldn't they? Did I mean taking taking Hull KR as an example? Neil Hodgson will be like, well, flipping heck, I've been chucking money in for ten, fifteen years, and then now you're telling me that I'm going to have to chuck in even more yeah. money. Um, but then at the same time, that's at odds with. I think this is where, I mean, I get into all sorts of scarpers on, and scrapes on Twitter because I think I, I'm always quite defensive of, of a few things because I'm like, well, it's all right having Toronto win, but then if you're thinking, well, we're going to protect all KR, they, it, they, they contradict each other. Mm. If you want Toronto win and you want the big city team spending a load of money, but then you want to protect Huddersfield and all KR, whatever, it's at odds with, it, with itself, isn't it? Um, and, uh, and it'd be interesting to see what Newcastle do like as well when they eventually get into Super League because... Well, it's a massive blow for them, isn't it, not getting promoted this year? Massive. It's like, especially the money they've spent compared to, to Oldham who, who, mm. who went up in... And especially of, when you consider Oldham, Oldham basically have to move grounds whenever they get promoted to the Championship because their actual ground isn't good enough to play yeah. the Championship. A bit, bit of a and then that, that, It's not a dig at Oldham. It's just, uh, it's just a shame it didn't work out for Newcastle because... I think it's important that that happened though. Just because there's so, there's so much potential in Newcastle and 
they're actually doing something in the community mm. as well. They're, they're not just spending big on big players and bringing big yeah. players to the first team. They've got an established academy. They've got, loads they've got a, fan, a fantastic ground as well. They're running reserves out next year. Yeah, they're running reserves. reserves. They, uh, they've, they've had a couple of, of players from the academy and from the, the scholarship system involved with the England mm. setup as well. Um, it's a nice ground, the artificial pitch. And it's a, it's it a looked really good on TV. A really good weekend for, for fans to, to obviously mm. go down and, and enjoy a weekend up in Newcastle. Um, they, so they've said they, they, going on, they, but, um, they've got this plan in, they've got this plan in place to win Super League by 2030 do you think they'll do it? that is a big ask isn't it well when you consider that we win what what's this the 24th season of Super League 25th, or 25 next year isn't it I think yeah 25th year next year only 4 teams have won it in that 24 years I think you, you've got to set goals, haven't you? Um, you, you? You have to. Well, I mean, I suppose if you think, I, I'd imagine every club in Super League at this moment in time would say, we want to win Super League by 2030. Because ultimately, that's, that's, that's the reason you're yeah, in but it. No, no one puts it out there. You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't see Huddersfield making a statement <laughs> saying, we're going to win. Uh, we're, we're aiming to win Super League by 2030, would you? I think. I like their ambition, I really do like their ambition uh, and I think it, it was good to, to announce it in that way and in that manner because they didn't say we're going to win it by 2050, we said that we're ambitious. In, in ambitious really and, uh, do you think Warrington will win it by 2030? They've got to haven't they, surely. In 10 seasons they've got to win Super League Grand Final. They've not won it in the last 10 seasons. Surely, with, with the money that they're spending though James, when you've got Blake Austin and Gareth Wynn up in the arms. Probably racking up close, yeah. close to to eight hundred thousand pound a year between them. So we've had, <laughs> we've, had, we've had four in the last twenty four years. Do you think we're going to have any new winners in the next ten years? Obviously, Warrington potentially Toronto. Depend if, if Toronto obviously succeed and propel as a club, they've got a good chance, haven't they, of of winning Super League? Because if you're thinking that if they make the, the Sunnyville Williams signing, how many more? players will want to go and play for Toronto, mm -hmm. um, just, to, just to play alongside Sonny Bill Williams. Um, so if it, t Toronto have got a good chance outside of that. Can't if, 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 if Catalan have a look? Hull? I'm, not, I'm, I'm losing be belief in Catalan, I'm yeah. honest. Um, to lose? It's, it's always the same old situation, isn't it? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's what it seems like with the Dragons. Before every single season and you're looking at every single squad, uh, in Super League, you think Catalans, they're the dark horses. Catalans will do well this year, they've made some good signs, and then it's always just the same mm. where, where they lack on away form and they lose silly games. Like they, they lost to, they, they, they got absolutely pumped, didn't they, by Salford at home? Mm. But, but, then, but then one one week they beat Saints at home, yeah. um, and it was and you just couldn't really put your, your finger on what was, was going wrong. Interesting to see that um, Steve McNamara got a three year deal yeah. uh, because a lot of people a lot of Catalans fans were calling for his head earlier on in the year um, well we'll see if there's anyone there we're, on, we're only two weeks out from uh, our trip to France for the uh, Elite One Championship Magic Weekend which kicks off the season over there um, going back to Toronto for a second they've announced that their on the road games are going to be in the UK so there's been a lot of talk about playing in Europe and all these headline grabbing oh we're going to play in Copenhagen and whatever and then obviously I'm, from I'm not going to lie I wanted, I wanted a trip to Amsterdam or yeah, Amsterdam so some of the, someone from the Netherlands said they might see it so a little disappointing when all this noise is being made about growing the game and ultimately they're going to be playing I mean last year they played what they played in Halifax Newcastle Batley Hull okay. they played in Hull didn't they um, they played, um, one, juice, one, they played at London, and everyone said, "Yeah, but it's London." But it's like, have you been to the New River Stadium? I mean, come on. If you were playing, I've not been to the New River I Stadium. I have, but it's like if you wanted to play in London, let at least play it somewhere. I mean, no disrespect to the New River Stadium; it's a great little community facility. But come on. So a, a little, I'm a little underwhelmed by that. But then, because I, I think the thing for me, the excuse was that it was too short notice. But I don't understand why they're going to get more notice next year. Uh, let me say, we don't need the cap. I'm a Warrington fan. I wouldn't want us to, to spend millions to win the league. I'd much rather us do it playing a level playing field. It also says Warrington, Toronto, and possibly Castleford uh, have a chance of winning it over the next couple of years. <coughs> Going back to the Toronto thing, um, I think y you would look at it was an opportunity for them to play the games, but 
I, I just didn't get the comments about they're not going to have much notice. Because they're surely not going to have the next season if they did it, they're still going to have the same notice. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I suppose you could say, yeah, they only knew they were going to be staying, they only knew they were going to get promoted, what, a month ago. But then, they're only going to know that they're safe potentially in, in Super League mm. a month previous. So anyway, let's um, run through some of the news um, on the site, loverabilly.com, please do keep visiting the site. Um, Witness have made a few re-signings this week, Sam Wild, the latest one, I think they also pulled in Lloyd Roby and Owen Buckley, um, two academy products, to Tim Sheens' squad. Um, there, New Zealand veteran Ben Matalino has retired, as has Australia's Matt Gillette. Oh, Matt Gillette, how old is he? Only 30. 30, yes, another one. He, he, I, both, seen, both I seen he released a, a video, didn't he? A, a little, little Burgess-esque mm. video. Um, Bradford, a few ins and outs at Bradford this week. David Foggin Johnston has extended his um, contract there, but Jai Hitchcock has gone to Toulouse. Yeah, which two, Toulouse two, are building a right little team, aren't they? Because they've got Frank Winterstein in. Yeah. They've recruited. Yeah, they're obviously spending a little bit more now, <laughs> now Toronto or out of out of the competition. It's it, the, it'd be the best way for, but it's the pressure's on to lose because if they don't go up this mm. year, that TV deal might end up uh, crushing them. The uh, the interesting one to point out with the interesting thing to note with to lose this year is obviously they're going to be playing at the rugby union ground, so it'll be interesting to see whether oh, yeah, and, whether um, they get more you know more fans in this year. Uh, keep an eye out on on lead social media channels as well next oh, Tuesday. Fine, think, yeah, think, um, because th it really seems like they're, they're going to be making quite a lot of announcements on, on Tuesday so we'll probably know what the, the 2020 squad's looking like we're uh, still, probably by 10pm Tuesday. We're still two weeks away from the start of the French Elite 1 season but the French Elite 2 season is, is three or four weeks in. I love this, I'm mentioning this because I love this score. Last weekend Le Scure beat Toulon 2-1. 36-1. That is a great score. You don't see that enough. Teams taking early drop goals or first half drop goals. Well, was it a first half drop goal? Or was I, it, I'm not was sure it just so they didn't get nil at the I, end of the game? I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. I'll have to find out. But 36-1 belted. Um, like that one. Um, Sonny Bill then. There's two or three NRL clubs. Do you think, is he going to go to Toronto? I think, I think, I think... And obviously, I don't, I don't know Sonny personally, but I think he'd rather go to Toronto than he would go to the think? NRL. But but you say that, but is he going to Toronto? Because they have to, he has to live in Manchester for half the year. Well, it'd be a good experience for him living in England, wouldn't it? He's never never lived over here. Not bad for it, for the last two years of your career, and then he'll play for Kiwis in 2021 World Cup and have a. Little swan song. He's 34 now. Be 36 by the time World Cup finishes in his two-year contract at Toronto. I, yeah. I, I, th <laughs> yeah, I think it's a, quite a, a luxury uh, offer that he's got on the table from the Wolfpack. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'd take 2.3 million a year. Um, New York's bid to join League One is reportedly going to get the green light by Christmas, so they want to join League One from 2021. Uh, and they're looking, they're looking at making a marquee sort of signing in League One. James Graves being mentioned, Benji Marshall, which I think is probably a bit ambitious because I think he'll be 36, 37 by the time they join well, the league. Yeah, but they go into League One. Well, yeah. So, so Benji Marshall in League One, why? I suppose. Like, come on. In some ways, the problem with that situation for New York is that if Ottawa were in there as well, you know. I mean, obviously they'll be two up, but it's gonna. That'd be really interesting to see how that dynamic panned out in terms of New York and Ottawa both chucking a load of money at it and going up head to head against each other. Uh, t Terry's just uh, commenting on the, the salary cap situation. Uh, the cap is a joke. Some clubs have players' wives earning more than other clubs' <laughs> uh, star players. Louis replies to him, says, "Can you name any other players' wives who work at clubs? This was an issue twenty years ago." Yeah, I've heard a couple of tales in the past <laughs> yeah, about, yeah. about players' wives being, uh, the, being the, paid thousands of, to, to, to be clean as... Yeah, club shop. I know, I've know i known people working in club shops before, definitely. And there was also the story that Gareth Hock... Remember the, the Gareth Hock story when he was at Salford and he flew to Dubai to, to pick up an envelope of cash or something like that, which he actually told the RFL in a tribunal or something like that, and that's what, that's what actually started the... 
process of fingering solving for the salary cap breach the other year. Um, interesting one. Um, Bradford, obviously, there's been a takeover at Bradford. Nigel Woods involved, and there's all sorts of capers relating to that. Well, he's got he's got a box at Bradford, hasn't he? He's had a box at Bradford for years. Well, I mean, anyone can get a box at Bradford. Come on, man. There's, um, there's, uh, there's, there's, a cam- there's a campaign being launched to bring Bradford back to Bradford because they're going to Dewsbury next year. Um, Odsall, I'm told, is just not financially viable to play. Two, they, they, they're what? saying two hundred thousand pounds to run Odsall next year for the RFL. Even now, it's interesting this because I was thinking about this. The RFL came out. Was it the RFL that came out and said it was two hundred grand, or was it just a report somewhere? Report. So they're saying it's going to cost. Clubs two hundred grand in the RFL. Does Super League own it or does the RFL own it? Because couldn't the Super League clubs basically say? No, I think RFL owns it, doesn't it? Well, so in that case, if it's going to cost two hundred grand, then the Super League clubs should turn around and say, well, "We're not paying it." This should just be one governing body, shouldn't it? That, that's, um, what it should, that's what it should be. But uh, Phil Phil Haynes also says could we end up with super teams and. Others are dropping away, so I think it means obviously the big spenders, Toronto. But isn't that what everyone wants? Isn't that what everyone wants? I, I you know, like well, I said, like no, I said this, I this, is, this is where we're at the crossroads because you've got the the people who want to to for, for rugby league to be strictly heartless, and then you've got the, the expansion. But I don't think it's that. I don't think it's that because, and I get good. I'm not bothered. I'm not bothered who plays, as long as everyone can play, right? And my issue with it is, is that everyone's saying, oh, but we need Toronto in, we need these in, we need, you know, we need this in for the big city deals and, and the big TV deals and stuff. But then on the other side, people are saying, well, it's going to kill off Hulk Ehar or Casford or whoever. And it's like, well, yeah, but you can't have both. It's like, and that's the problem. I think you've got to understand that, okay, at the moment, it's, if you've had these super teams, you're going to kill off Hulk Ehar, Casford, maybe Huddersfield, whatever. But if you if you think there's a chain of clubs that this has happened to already, Workington, Halifax, Bradford, Oldham, it's already happened to them clubs maybe 10, 20 years ago. And it's like, it needs to surely get into a position where it can have both of these. You can't just keep bringing new teams in and then killing other ones off. So, I, look, I, I think the best solution is probably to have, uh, if they're going to have these super teams or whatever you want to call it, is make that a franchise league. And then just let everyone else, you know, we have like a separate British league if you want, or European league, whatever you want to call it. Because I just think you, you need to. I don't know. It, could you imagine if? Could you imagine if? Um, what's a good example? Like I don't know. Imagine if they they canned the Scottish football league and brought them all into the Premier League, and all of a sudden Celtic and Rangers were kick, making you know meaning that certain teams couldn't be in Premier League. Do you know what I mean? It's just a bit like, I mean, that might be a bad example, but I just think, I think that's the problem. You want, everyone wants the best teams to get better and spend more money, but then it's almost like people say, well, no, we don't want that. So it's like, well, make your mind up, which, which one is it? You know, what do you want? Uh, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Um, I, don't, I don't want to think myself to be a furry. I don't like the sound of a franchise league, I'm not going to lie. I but the, the, the problem you've got is, well, let's say let's say we get to let's say Super League's twelve, and you've got Toronto, New York, Ottawa, Catalan, London Broncos, right? There you and Toulouse. So you half the league is an expansion, and the other half is I don't know Wigan, Warrington, Saint Helens, Leeds, all. One of them is going to get relegated, or two of them is going to get relegated, or whatever. Now. Like, I just don't, I just don't see a situation where, and then what do they get relegated to? They get relegated into a league that's got Casford, Wakefield, Widnes. Do you know what I mean? It's a bit like, well, do you know what I mean? It's a bit like, it's a bit like you split the if you split. I don't know, use football as an example again. It's a bit like if the top six had their own league, and one of them got relegated every year, and you'd be like, and then they'd go into a league where I don't know Chelsea are playing against Burnley, and. Watford every week and not, and do you know what I mean? And I think that's my that's my issue with it. You know, 
In an ideal world, look, in an ideal world, you'd have an American, well, surely you'd have an American League, a French League, an English League, and then mm. have some sort of world tournament, like Champions League type thing. Phil says, how many teams do you think will be able to afford a no cap? Uh, Toronto, Warrington, I think Wigan could do it. Saints, Leeds, Leeds, Hull, said Catalan. I mean, New, you, you, you don't know. You don't the know. Play. The thing is, is you, if you remove the cap, you don't know whether it would attract investment from mm-hmm. somewhere else. You know, so that's the thing. You don't know necessarily. You know, someone might, a businessman might come along and want to chuck a load of money at it because there's no salary cap. Um, you, know, you know, you look at Derek Coleman at Lit. He might think, well, without a salary cap, I might be able to chuck. You know, he might want to sign Sonny Bill Williams. Whether Sonny Bill Williams would want to live in Lee is another question. Um, or like Dave Parkinson. There's no train station, for instance. Um, but you know what I mean? It's like, you know, all those little little things. So you don't know what's going to happen. Let's talk about, um, let's go on to the games then. Let's talk about Great Britain and last weekend's game first before we look ahead to the, the second test match against... New Zealand. What did you think of the game against Tonga? Of course, Tonga won well, I 14-6. Right, I, I didn't think it was a good first half performance from Great Britain at all. I think it wasn't a great Tonga, second half performance. So, well, I mean, they were much better, much more fluent in attack, and all the score scoreboard doesn't really suggest it. But they were, they were more fluent in attack, caused Tonga far more problems in the second half. The first half, I, I just think they didn't get going. And Tonga just completely steamrolled them through the middle. Um, as, as was kind of expected, we kind of expected Tonga to start the game and uh, bash us through the middle. They did that, they tied it, our forwards down. It didn't help with Luke Thompson leaving the field after 15 minutes and not returning because obviously that puts us uh, a sub down as well as, and against a massive pack in the Tonga pack. But I've, what I didn't really understand is that. It was portrayed as this huge upset, this massive shock, and when you compare the Tonga squad to the Great Britain squad, there are, there are more players playing in the Tonga team who ply the trade in the NRL, which is the elite competition. I understand the, what you're saying, but, but, Great but squad. ultimately, Great Britain, you know, we're talking about when will Great Britain ever end Australia's, you know, will, will they ever beat Australia in a series? So for a Great Britain to then lose. To Tonga is quite a surprise, and I think it was the first. It's the first ever meeting, wasn't it? I think between Great Britain mm. and Tonga. Um, my my yeah, thing was the two the two tries yeah, Tonga. There'll be there'll be, there'll be, there'll be there'll be more plays in that Tonga team earning more than what the Great Britain team do. Mm, maybe the, there was what six or seven players who played for Great Britain who played in the NRL. And there was only four players in the Tonga team who played in Super League. The rest played in the NRL. Well, yeah, you said yeah, but don't forget they could be playing in the NRL on sixty to hundred grand, and there could be players in the Great Britain team playing in Super League on 100, 150 grand. Well, you know Jason I mean? Tomalolo on a ten-year contract at Cowboys <laughs> on a million quid a year. So come on. Um, a few points. The the two tries were both very not lucky, but off the cuff tries were they? Obviously, they kept the ball and Hooter, and then the, the first try was off that mistake by Gareth well, by Lachlan Cooper. Gareth Widdop sold him down the river. Um, <laughs> it didn't it? I bought, I bought Widdop. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, Widdop should have dealt with that, shouldn't he? Matt, so obviously, apart from those two sort of broken play incidents, there wasn't much going. I think my main issue with Great Britain is, or, or England, or Wayne Bennett, or whatever, is they just, they just seem so geared towards completing the sets and building pressure. It's so boring to watch. They just, they don't look like they're ever. They don't look like they're wanting to score tries. They just look like they're wanting to complete the sets and get. And I understand that that's maybe how good the league is at the moment. It's very formula, formulaic, but it's like it almost felt like they were just quite happy to complete the sets, get a kick in, turn the ball around, and it was just a bit, a bit drab for me. Um, mm. okay. And a very disappointing okay. result, I think. Oh, I mean, oh. I know what you're saying about Tonga being strong, but you know, first Great Britain game back and. You know, on the day that England Rugby Union reached the World Cup final, it was a massive, you know, bit of a mm, bit drab. Yeah. Um, I f- yeah, it, it was a, it was a bit drab that obviously England Rugby Union reached the World Cup final and 
obviously we we were we defeated by Tonga, but Tonga are no pushovers now. They've beaten New Zealand. They've beaten Great Britain. Well, like, they, they just beat Australia now for the for the exactly, clean sweep. They exactly. played this week, did they? Tonga yeah. Australia this week. Uh, it, well, there's a triple header at Eden Park, isn't there? It starts with Fiji versus Samoa. Um, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Zealand Great Britain. Britain. Right, well, let's, we'll do the teams. Great Britain have changed it up a little bit for Saturday, which again is on BBC. Is on BBC Two. It's at half three in the morning, so I'd maybe record it. Um, Lomax is in at fullback. McGilvray, Hardacre, Jake Connor is in at centre in place of Gildart, who is injured and out with the rest of the tour. Ryan Hall. The missing one on this list that I'm reading here because Jackson Hastings isn't in it. Widdop and Hastings are the halves. Um, Hill, Hodgson, Tom Burgess, front row, Bateman, Whitehead, Graham. The bench is Jones, Philbin and Clark both come in, they weren't in it last week, and Wormsley. Yeah, Hastings isn't on that list on BBC website. Well, you're not, you're not reading Love Rubble League, are you, James? No, no. Um, um, yeah, three changes when Bennett's made. Um, obviously, Oliver Gildart and Luke Thompson ruled out through injury. Lachlan Q's been dropped. Lomax to full back. Uh, Daryl Clark and Joe Philbin coming on the bench, and who's the other one who's coming in? Clark, Clark and Philbin. No, Clark and Philbin Connor. on the bench, and Jake Connor in the centre in place of Gilbert. New Zealand are going to Ivarsa Shek, Mal Malo, Nicole Clockstad, Manu, Izako, Foran comes in at half with Marshall, Tetevano, Smith, Warrior Hargreaves. Nikora and Bromwich, I've lost count of how many players have gone through there. Oh, and Tapin as well, and then Hughes, Hawara, Neora, Armal and Blair on the bench. Um, I just wanted to raise about this, obviously Great Britain playing New Zealand this week and next week. It's stupid that they're not playing Australia, and I know it's not Great Britain's fault, I know it's Australia's fault, but you look at why, why if you look at New Zealand, Great Britain, Tonga and Australia, they could have all just played each other once. Mm-hmm. So, like, you know, Great Britain could have easily played Australia this week, in my opinion. You know, Australia playing Tonga, why are they not playing Great Britain? Great Britain are playing New Zealand. Why couldn't Great Britain have had a tour where they played Tonga, New Zealand, Australia, Papua New Guinea? doesn't make any sense as to why that's not happening. It doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, but we've had this conversation. I can't, I can't be bothered getting into it. <laughs> we'll see the Aussies next year. <laughs> well, we're, we're well, we'll, we'll, well, will we? That's well, the question. Um, so yeah, so New Zealand, Great Britain, and then Australia, Tonga is on Saturday, four a.m. kickoff over here. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll tell you when it's on. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> Based on last week, probably not because. Uh, I'll be, I'll be getting up for it. Um, let me, let me. I'm just trying to find it. Where is it? Oh yeah. Um, some timings then. Three thirty. It starts on BBC Two. Four a.m. kickoff. There's a repeat on the red button at half past nine Saturday morning. And then the highlights are on BBC One at quarter past one in the afternoon. Um, nationwide as well, not just North. So the um, London Broncos fans can watch it. Um, what about uh, Workington, man? Should we have a bit of a chat about that? Rugby League is getting a load of attention because the, the powers what, what's that What's getting be... more boring? Bre- talk of Brexit or talk of Bradford being at also... <laughs> I'm gonna go Brexit, I think. Um, but but yeah, the uh, so well, working well, man. So so, so the Tories have basically decided that the key to them winning the majority of the election is to uh, target rugby league towns. Um, an opportunity for rugby league. Maybe we should we could bribe them, couldn't we? We could say, well, I'll tell you what. If you pump in mil- hundreds of millions in civil rugby league, get it on BBC. Get the Super League show national, you know. First, maybe we should. Maybe we're missing opportunity here. Maybe Workington man should go, you know, should send them down to to Ten Downing Street and say, "Here, here's our request. We want a live game on terrestrial TV every week. We want the Super League show nationwide. We want a title sponsor." And we want to see Boris at uh, Workington Town game. <laughs> yeah, anything like that, because they're all the same anyway, aren't they, politicians? So. Um, We'll leave it there on that one anyway. <laughs> um, let's just see. Is there any is there any other any other gossip or news we want to talk about? Well there's someone someone who might be signing for Salford this week. Oh Dan Fleming, we've heard about that. Halifax. He saw he, he has Halifax have announced him though for next season. Yeah, he signed he signed a one year deal with Halifax's hometown club. Uh 
only in September. Um, mm. But you'd think the the thought and the idea of playing full time rugby league is appealing to anyone. Um, forgot one of the witness retentions, McGrath a little Um Bradford have announced that they cut junior season ticket prices, and my eyes were watering when I read the prices that they initially charged. A hundred and ninety nine pound for a junior season ticket. At Bra- was it hundred ninety nine pound? Hundred and forty. It, I think it was hundred and forty nine pounds oh, to sit down. Now listen, words. it was hundred and forty nine pounds oh. to sit down, and then it was ninety nine pounds to stand up, and it's gone down from na- it's gone down to ninety nine pounds to stand up and forty nine pounds to sit down. Bear in mind that we're already playing in Dewsbury. Now I think part of the issue with it is because obviously you've got limited capacity at Dewsbury. Whether they're, they're conscious that they don't want to sell too many junior tickets because. You know, but if obviously every junior ticket means that they can't sell an extra adult one. Um, Jack Hughes is going to have surgery after the Great Britain tour. I spoke to him a couple of weeks ago. Um, Older have signed Lewis Charnock. Good, good sign, I mean, for all of them. Sam Hollis has signed a new deal at Bradford. Um, your mate Brad Billsborough has signed for North Wales Crusaders. Um, We've got a competition to win a signed Great Britain shirt that's on the site. Get to loverbleed.com forward slash win and you have that. Craig Hall. Let's talk about Craig Hall. He's gone to Featherstone permanently. Really, we can't get our heads around this. I just think it's a, a strange deal, isn't it? I, I thought it was strange for him to go to Featherstone in the first place. You know, yeah, on loan. on loan. Because I think he played every single game for Hull Cow last season. I think. I'm sure he made over, over 30 appearances. Uh, for the Robins, so it makes you wonder what has gone on there because even if he was just used as a squad player this year, you'd, you'd think um, you, you, that they keep him. So unless he's and he, I mean, he's prolific, he scores tries, he kicks goals, he's versatile, he can play fullback, he can play centre, he can play stand up, play on the wing. That's what I mean. I think, I think uh, it's, it's so strange how all care of letting go, but obviously they've, they've just signed the five lads from Bradford, so, so they can't keep everyone. Um, Tom Burgess reckons that Great Britain are disadvantaged by not having a mid-season test, which I think is a fair point. I mean, even if it wasn't yeah. Great Britain, England, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, why can't they play mid-season tests? Yeah, well, they could... I, I, I know people go on about competition for England and not having a um, serious competition in the Northern Hemisphere, but even if you had England v Wales and then Ireland v Scotland, you could have had it on as a double header. Uh, somewhere in the country. I mean, it's worth noting as well that England would obviously probably not bring over the NRL lads. Yeah. So, you know, could you have England England Knights, you know? Possibly. And do it that way. Um, well, well, I think it's got more of a draw doing England Wales or England. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Nathaniel Petteru has left Leeds. He wasn't up to much. York have re signed Liam Salter. Bob Bezik has signed for Newcastle. I'm sure he probably signed thinking they'd be in the Championship. 25 caps for Ireland. Um, Women, the Women's World Cup 2021 will... 26 it'll be now because he played against Spain. Women's World Cup in 2021 is being extended. That's to give them a minimum of four day turnaround between each game, which is good. It starts at Headingley um, in 2021. That'd be good. Ireland, as you mentioned, beat Spain. And Spain took the lead in that game, actually. Um, Scotland are close to qualify for the World Cup. They beat Serbia 86-0. It was a close one, that one. It was 56-0 at half-time, but Scotland just about saw it out in the second half. Oh, right, did they? I, um, I, I, thought, I thought Serbia would have pulled back into it. Jamie Thackeray has signed for Whitehaven at the age of 40. He looks very trim. I see in the interview he said he, he, he looks in really good shape. He says he needs to put on at least the stones to play, and he does look a bit... He looks, he looks in great shape, but certainly... Half the man he probably used to be when he was at Hull. Well, he, was, um, he was playing for Keith last season, wasn't he? Did he play a few against Keith last season? Um, Sam Barlow is training with Halifax. His four-year drugs ban is nearly up. Yeah, um, Halifax loud, well, isn't he? Yeah. George Flanagan has signed a new deal at Bradford. Dan Murray is stopping at Hull KR. And Ryan Lannan is stopping at Salford. They had a bit of a loan switch at some point last year. Um, and then Scott Griggs, who announced he was leaving Huddersfield last week, his coach, he had a coach, he was like a player coaching role, wasn't he? Um, or rather, I think they'd taken off the player player list at Huddersfield, didn't they? I think, I'm not sure. He wasn't playing, was he? But no. um, he's sacked in his coaching job at Huddersfield because he wanted to play and he's gone to Halifax. Um, of course, his brother is the coach. Um, anything else to add? 
Can I go get the lunch now? Competition? Yeah, I'm hungry. We mentioned the competition. I'm hungry. Lucy will not be listening to us. Yeah, um, we mentioned the competition. Win the sign great big share. Please do uh, keep it lovebully.com for all your latest rugby league uh, news, views and, and anything else. We might have sponsorship soon as well. Yeah, yeah, we're looking at that. Drew's looking at that. We are, we've got Betfred already, but um, always looking oh, for yeah. nice partners as well to join. We could have our lunch on the show. Couldn't we? Don't, Don't give it away. away yet, we could have our lunch on the show. Yeah, Big Mac and chips, you never know. <laughs> um, thanks as always to Betfred for sponsorship. Thanks for tuning in. We're here every Thursday, 12 till 1. We'll see you next week.